Polls predict that France's far-right National Rally Party is on a path to win the snap parliamentary elections called by President Emmanuel Macron earlier this month. Voting will take place in two rounds on June 30 and July 7, 2024. Much has been said about how political parties have been reorganizing as a result, notably how socialists, Greens, and communists have put aside their differences to form a new popular front. But the cleavages at stake are not just between parties. They are also between voters and the political class. This explains the appeal of the extreme, such as the far right, but may also be seen in the growth in protests and civil disobedience movements around ecology, pension reform, discrimination and racism. These have been met by increased police repression under the Macron government. In this episode of Who is Voting in 2024, we will focus on the latter. How is French civil society mobilizing to turn anger, fear and hope into a political force that can make its way to the ballot and counter the rise of the extreme right? We are joined by Sarah Durieux, former director of FrancisChange.org platform and co-director of the Multitude Foundation. She is also the author of the book, Changing the World, an activism toolkit to take power. All right, Sarah, thank you so much for being with us. Let me start with perhaps a more conceptual question. Your book, your work has sought to inspire activism for many years. Let us talk about what activism represents for you. Some would argue, for example, that activism is a sign of the failure of our systems of political representation, and citizens are forced to organize themselves to make themselves heard. But others would say that activism and polarization are a necessary byproduct of change towards, let's say, a more just world. How do you conceive of activism? First of all, thank you for having me. I think that your question comes to the idea of, is there a separation between what we call activism and what we see as more formal ways of doing social change, like institutionalized politics, yes. for example? I think that for me, what's really important is that stop seeing this as two different things. I think there are different ways to operate, but they are leaning towards the same idea, which is social change. And I do think that the reason why we think there is a gap between those two activities is because there is a failure of our system of political representation, as you say it. Actually, I think activists should be a little bit more political and politicians should be a little bit more of activists. And I want to talk about what I mean by activism so it's easier to understand why I think that is. For me, activism is the idea of being affected by an issue and taking action to solve that issue. It's the idea of centering people who are affected in the idea of social change. That's the difference between the intermediation that can happen with more institutionalized way of doing social change. I think the crisis of representation is that we've given up on the idea of empowering people to step up for what they believe in, but also what affect them. So for me, there's no such thing as activism being necessarily polarizing activities. I think activism is necessary to recenter the experiences of people in social change work. I don't think that what's happening right now is necessarily only a failure of activism or only a failure of institutionalized politics. I think activism needs to evolve and politicians as well need to evolve and see what's going on. I think we are at a moment of of realigning uh, what those ways of doing social change are in order for them to be connected and to be more effective. Thank you so much, Sarah. And one way to recenter those affected by the issues themselves is organized civil society. And I would like to ask you, would you talk about civil society today in France in the singular or in the plural? If we talk about civil societies in the plural, how would you distinguish between the different groups? Would it be, for example, in terms of methods of advocacy, of the issues they push for, what they represent, or maybe their emotions, hope, anger? Yeah, I think you're right. I, I, it, it's interesting because I, I never put it this way, but I agree with you that maybe we should talk about civil societies. There's a, such a high plurality of not only focus, but also ways of action, and finally of conception of what social change is. So first of all, in terms of focus, I think in the past 15 to 20 years, we've seen a change with the increasing use of social media and internet for activism. We've seen a more narrow way to do social change work. So you will have groups that will organize around a very specific issue. So there's a difference of focus. There is a very, very plurality, plurality sorry, of focus. 
but also a plurality of way of action. You know, you will have obviously people who do the activism the way we know it. So advocacy work, working with political leaders to influence their decision, civil disobedience to raise an issue and force political leaders to take action on, on specific questions. But you can also have people who will do work in a different manner with coalition building between different actors of N different NGOs and different political parties. So there's many different ways to do activism. And finally, there's many different ways also of seeing social change. And I think that's the big challenge we have right now in the era of polarization is that there are people who will go through a, a more of a reform approach of social change. So we want to kind of slowly move the system to increase its efficiency. And you have people who want to go through more of a revolutionary approach where we need kind of to break the system completely and rebuild it. And so I think the importance for me is to be able to understand that all of this plurality of action are important for social change. The multiplicity of ways of doing activism is what make activism and social change possible, but also resilient in the face of more and more authoritarian regimes. I would argue that there are civil societies in the sense that there's such a variety of action, such plurality. And at the same time, it's so important that we start building coalitions. It is really key that actors who are doing social change, who are very narrow focused, learn about other people, what they do, how they do it, how they can complete each other's work and how they can therefore be a little bit more resilient. Thank you, Sarah. Let me maybe build on this notion of multiplicity. Could you say a few words perhaps about the evolution of the relationship between civil society or rather societies and the political class in recent years? We are doing research as part of the center with climate activists in France, and we hear a lot about increased sort of anger and frustration on the one hand, and met with increased police repression on the other. Is that what you see too? Are there multiple trends at once if we talk about civil societies? Or rather, is there a shared experience among these different groups uh, and multiplicities of uh, perhaps of a breakdown in, in communication or collaboration with the political class? Yeah, I, I think definitely a shared experience of people who are doing activism and who don't find political leadership and political class being open enough to the evolutions they're trying to push for. On the other hand, we are seeing more political leaders struggling update their system, like the way they've been functioning for a very long time has evolved and now they need to open much more to a much broader civil society uh, space. So I would, I'm always trying to be in empathy with people doing work on side of the institution and people doing the work as activists. I think for it to work, there needs to be an update on what politics is for. And politics and political class, their main goal is representation. Political parties exist because we have election system and because we have a system of political representation, because we elect people so that they are able to represent ourselves in different parliaments, etc. So we need this politics to be representative and for it to be representative, it needs to be inclusive. One thing we must know is that there is no activism under authoritarianism. We've seen it in so many countries. We've seen it so across the globe that what's happening when authoritarian regime are in place is that there is an attack on civil society, freedom of press, freedom of association, and that it's harder and harder to create change under such regime. And all of this authoritarian regime we've seen in the past years, they came to power through election. They've been elected. So politics is really key. And that's really what I'm fighting for, is for us to understand that there's no such thing as work for freedom of press under author authoritarian regime. And therefore, we need to have political leadership able to address the issues of people if they want to be elected and if they don't want to lose over other more authoritarian or populist political parties that are attacking the base of democracy. So it is, I would say that politics is both the problem and the solution to the issue we're facing, which is like politics is not functioning and that's why we have issues and that's why we don't make progress on like issues like social change or equality or social justice. We need to be bold and we need to be hopeful that we can make politics work differently as activists, but also as members of these civil societies and engage in this political system in the way it functions in, in the kind of people that this system puts forward for election and for representing other people. 
So, Sarah, this takes us um, to the current moments, this current tense moments in the lead up to the upcoming elections. Uh, let us talk a bit about your work on organizing. Where have you chosen to focus your energy and why as part of the Fondation Multitude or otherwise? Yeah, so I, I would say that the, the, the reason why I joined Multitude is because I think that we need to have more activists within the philanthropic space to be able to really ground the decisions we make for funding in the realities of, of the work that's done on the ground. And, and at the same time, I think we really need to have a very strong philanthropic approach uh, when it comes to funding political work on the ground. At the moment, I'm playing with my two hats, but I think there are many things we're, we're trying to do. And I just want to say before I talk about some of the things I've been involved in is there's just so much that I don't know, because this is the reality of the moment. There's been such a strong energy that's being put out after the decision that was made two weeks ago by President Macron to dissolve the parliament and to call for a snap election. We've done different things. The first thing we are trying to do is to fund the work. So it's to find bold and smart and fast moving funders who can help for the urgent effort that's happening right now. And especially the effort that's led in the area and in the places where there is both the most to lose for people, but also the most potential e impact if they get involved. So we are talking about rural areas. Funding this work has been one of my main activities. The second thing has been really trying to use the kind of organizing, community organizing philosophy, which is the idea of people before projects. So you put people in touch and you help them connect to facilitate their collective strategy, but also resource sharing. I think that's also one of the things that philanthropic funders must do is to see themselves as organizers able to unlock resources as funding, but also facilitate the work between different actors. Because in those moments, we need people who are not actively doing the work on the ground that can facilitate the exchange and the resource sharing. Everything's moving very fast. And I think one of the learning we've seen in this kind of coordination effort that I've been part of is that the most effective way in those kind of urgent moments is to have decentralized action. There are initiatives, for example, who were very strongly activating, working around a coalition of the progressive uh, movement through influence towards political parties and pushing them also to invest people who are on the ground uh, as, as polit political uh, candidates. But we've seen also voters' engagement. So a lot of activities to get people out to vote have been run in many places. Last week, there's been a, a full day of phoning. So the idea of like taking your phone and calling five contacts to ask them to vote and come and vote. There's been more than, I think, 18,000 phone calls that have been passed on Tuesday. But we're also seeing a really interesting work on influencers' engagement. Uh, so the idea of having social media influencers being actively promoting uh, the idea of if you want to have a voice, if you want to have a choice, you should go out and vote. So this is just a few of the initiatives that we've seen uh, uh, around. And I've been involving myself with others to really like facilitate the exchange of knowledge and resources, but also finding funding and resources to help those initiatives to be as efficient as possible. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, may I ask you how to engage those who are perhaps more disconnected or disappointed by politics to the point of apathy, um, including young people from working class neighborhoods who may have felt for a very long time that they're not listened to by the political class. There's been a recent uh, Ipsos study that shows that 75% of young people from such neighborhoods believe it's important to engage in politics, but actually eight out of 10 feel completely mistreated by the media and political class. So how to overcome this challenge? Yeah, I think I saw the same study and it was really interesting because we've heard for a very long time the idea of young people being disengaged and not being political enough. This kind of narrative that's been floating around that it's absolutely false, you know, like there's just different ways to engage, but there's a, such a strong political awareness uh, amongst those groups. So I think that the first thing is to not denied in some way, like they politi their political will by imagining that they are not engaged. I think that's the first thing to say. But I think that for these groups, like younger people, like others, the first thing we need to do, and this is true for political parties, but it is also true for unions or any association or member of civil society. If you want to engage people, 
If you want people to be engaged, don't tell them what they have to do. Listen to them and ask them what they need in order to empower themselves. Like, I think really this posture of humility, of being a facilitator of change, being someone who is looking for not doing charity, but doing empowerment work is so important. So that's the first thing. It's really rebuilding this community organizing practice within everything that we do as people involved in social change. And building power for people is not just helping them to build power to influence politics. I think it's also helping them to build power to engage in politics, to be political representative. And for that, there's been a lot of initiatives that also we are supporting with Multitude Foundation to really develop the ability for people to stand up as political leaders, to reimagine the way politics can function. And for that, there are, we had a study that we've done before launching Multitudes to understand what are the barriers to political re representation and engagement. And some of the things that came up are very clear, the nature of our society, the exclusionary nature of our society is true in political leadership. Sexism, racism, all these kind of discrimination that make it harder for people to get into office. But there's also things that are more specific to politics, like a culture of loyalty that disrupts the ability of new people to enter in politics and like always keeping the same people over and over again. There's also a culture of tokenization and it is very true for all these people who are disconnected from politics where you have a party list and you want to make sure that you look like you care about involving people who are disenfranchised by politics so you will find this one person that we, you will put up front in, in the poster. But what do you really do so that more people have the ability to be part of different teams of different parties lists. I think one of the things that need to be done is, is what I call party reform, which is like reviewing like the way political parties function in all different parties. But there's also like all this idea of skill building. One thing that we've seen is that in some way, the skill of doing politics, whether it's campaigning, so what are the ways to get into power, but also how do you stay in power, what it is to hold the mandate, like how do you deal with coalition? This is such a specific skill set that is still today reserved to a few and it needs to be democratized. It needs to be able for anyone to stand up for office, to win a campaign, but also to do a good mandate once elected. So today there's very little funding in Europe for people uh, from disenfranchised group to organize. And that's really a problem. Most of the funding that comes for democracy work in Europe, which is very little, by the way, is focused on more participatory approach. But we need to talk about power. Like It is very important that we help more people to participate. But what does it mean in a political system that is broken? What does it mean if you participate to a citizen's assembly, like it's been the case in France, on climate, and you work for many weeks and you feel very proud you've been part of a innovative approach, but at the end of the day, it is all comes down to a political decision from a political leader that is disconnected from the reality of the ground. If you have such a strong homogeneity of people in power, you actually cannot create change. And so we really need to do this work. We need to fund this work. And that's what we are actively uh, trying to push as, as multitudes. Thank you so much, Sarah. Let us continue talking about the youth vote. It seems that among the sort of 18 to 29 age brackets, the far right appears to be quite popular. Polls are predicting it will get over a third of the votes, which I suppose is not different from other demographics, but can su surprise because there are some preconceived ideas that younger generations are perhaps more progressive than their peers. So how do we explain this? You're right. When you look at numbers, there's this idea that young people are more progressive. But the reality is that the, the rise of the far right is true across the board on, very, on all different age groups. It's also true uh, across different sociology, like you, you can see it in all parts of society. So it's not specific to younger people. I would say there are two things. The first thing is disenfranchising is the key for any extreme right vote. So Young people are more precarious. They don't see a future. The populist appeal is to say, we're going to give you some dignity. We're going to put you back in, into a dignified place. But it doesn't mean that it's necessarily going to happen. So I think that's the reason why this is taking off for, for younger people. But also, 
there's such a strong uh, social media influence. And we now know, because it's been documented, that extreme right parties are much more savvy at social media than traditional parties. Very interesting. I would love to hear a bit about some short and longer term objectives to your organizing. Of course, there's the elections coming up at the beginning of July, but but the, the possibility of the far right winning also in 2027, the general elections looms large as well as longer political objectives in France. Yeah, I think that uh, right now we see the urgency and urgency is always a good moment to take action. So I'm glad that this urgency is helping people to see that we need to get on with this issue of political uh, reimagination. But on the medium to long term, we shouldn't be deriving all of our effort on the urgent. We should build for the, the medium and long term. I think we need to build the infrastructure for organizing by and for people especially people most affected. We need to fund and support local grassroots groups working with communities to build their political power. The second thing we need to do is to really build sol solidarity and resilience. Uh, under authoritarian regime, that's really key, that civil societies are connected, work together, support each other. And finally, I think uh, France, of course, is at stake and France is an important European partner in the European Union. And that's why building European connection and solidarity is so key. That's why we need to know that the playbook that's used by authoritarian regime in Europe is the same in every country. So what do we do concretely so that we also build a playbook for democracy and political inclusion across Europe? Thank you, Sarah. Perhaps some concluding thoughts. Are there lessons from French civil society and organizing for other European countries where the extreme right is also rising? I think some of the learning from France is we shouldn't let normalize uh, the extreme right party. I think that's been one of the issues we've seen is to constantly remind ourselves what is the root of those parties? How were they born? They were born on like xenophobic, racist, undemocratic purpose, and they still are today. And even though we are seeing that those parties are trying to normalize their position, we've seen what's happening in other countries. So we shouldn't be fooled by uh, the package because we know what's behind. And I think for that, we need everyone. We need, obviously, civil society organization. We need political leaders, but we also need the private space. And I think business leaders also are so key in the way we can avoid to normalize the extreme right party. The second thing I would say is to address the core issue that people are facing. And these issues are social like, exclusion, for example. And it is something that we really need to not only get on with, but with action. And there are many things that we can do as civil society and as leaders to address uh, that question. And, and finally, I think that uh, leading with hope and not fear is key. I think that what's been damaging to the democratic political space is to only lead with fear of what could happen or rejection of what the system is. But if we want our people to buy into a new vision of the world, we need to make it front page. It shouldn't be we say once in a while. The vision of society that the extreme right has built is very clear and is constantly repeated in every media space that they are having, in every screen time that they have. So what is our vision and how do we promote it? This is really key. And hope is the only thing that will bring people to action, especially because it's so hard to constantly fight back. It's better to fight for and we need to get on with that. Thank you, Sarah. This is a nice place to end, I think. Thank you for joining us and your important work on the matter. Thank you very much for having me.